the angel and the devil. If you had an infinite chessboard in your cupboard, who would you want to play? Like many difficult things, the rules are super simple. One of the players is the angel, and at each turn the angel flies to some square on the board. Before the game begins, we would agree on how far the angel is able to travel, and we call that number of squares its power. For instance, the angel of power 1 can travel just one square in any direction, essentially the king in chess. An angel of power 2 could travel anywhere within this region, one of power 3 to any of these squares, and so on. In comes the second character, the devil. Whenever the devil lands on a square, it burns that square, making it inaccessible to the angel for the remainder of the game. Much like the angel, on every turn the devil can move to another square, but unlike the angel, is able to travel as far as it wishes. And those are basically the rules. The devil then wins the game if it eventually traps the angel, and the devil has a winning strategy if it is always able to win. A useful way to think about this is the devil having a set of instructions such that regardless of what the angel does, the devil can look up the current layout in its large instructions book and deliver the perfect reply, which will keep the angel contained in some large predetermined region at all times. The angel has a winning strategy if the devil doesn't, meaning it can always evade the devil. So which character here has the upper hand? Well, when John Conway introduced this problem, and when he then wrote an article about it some years later, he published a collection of counter strategies to ones that might seem appealing initially. I will briefly talk about the first and simplest. One idea you might have is, I'll have my angel fly some amount of north at every move. Conway calls this angel the fool, and that's because the fool loses to the devil. Let's take a fool of power one. Here's what the devil will do. It'll picture all the squares the fool might land on in the forthcoming terms and it plans to build a wall on the rope just after. The devil also takes note of the half distance between the fool and the future wall. Every time the fool moves, the devil burns one out of four squares above. When the fool reaches the halfway point, the devil restricts its interest to the new smaller region now accessible to the fool and concentrates its efforts on a shorter barrier. With every move, the devil burns squares so that half are now taken, and we repeat twice more, blocking the fool of power one. Conway's first example is to show that this can be scaled to beat fools of any power, using the exact same tactic of progressively filling in a wall of suitable width far away, and every time the fool halves its distance from there, the devil restricts its efforts to a wall half that size. The distance at which the devil builds its wall gets big extremely quickly. In fact, even for a fool of power 2, to be completely foolproof, the devil should start building around 8.5 billion squares north of it. For 24 years, the world only knew the angel of power 1 would lose, but otherwise the question remained open. Then suddenly in 2006, four different independent proofs came about answering some amount of the core question. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the really clever argument Andras Mate makes to prove that angels of power 2 or more have a winning strategy, which answers the question completely. What I like about Mate's creative argument is that it involves introducing two new characters, and one of those is the Nice Devil. The Nice Devil avoids all squares which the angel could have accessed at an earlier stage of the game, so the angel is effectively building a growing region the devil cannot land on. It might seem like this is a disadvantage, but here's our first fact. If the devil beats the angel, so does the Nice Devil. In other words, this restriction is not a disadvantage at all. Here's how the proof goes. Suppose the devil has a winning strategy, and say the angel of power 2 has flown along this path so far. The nice devil then does the following. It imagines the angel traveling backward, but selecting the oldest possible square it can reach at each step. The result is a new legitimate path between the starting point and the end, which we call the reduced path. The nice devil looks at this path, conjures the evil devil, and asks, what move would you make if the angel had taken this reduced path? If the devil answers with a square within the forbidden region for the nice devil, we'll just have the nice devil pass that turn, but otherwise the nice devil will simply follow the real devil's advice. There is however one subtlety that needs taken care of. What if when asked the devil cannot give an answer? What if the devil says, I'm sorry nice devil, but I never would have let this path happen because I would have occupied one of these squares if I'd seen an earlier portion of this path. Well, if that were the case, there are two possibilities. 
If that square were outside of the Forbidden Region at that earlier stage of the game, the Nice Devil would have also burnt it, contradicting the existence of the original path. The only other possibility is if this burnt square were inside that earlier region. But then this would disagree with the path reduction we found initially, since that burnt square comes strictly later than the one the Angel is on. So the reduced path is always recognized by the Devil. And if the Devil has a winning strategy, this path is a losing path for the Angel meaning the position of the angel is being kept inside some large predetermined region at all times, so the nice devil, which has the angel in that same position, also wins. So what's the mathematical motivation behind this? Well, another way of saying if the devil wins, the nice devil wins, is if the nice devil loses, so does the devil. In other words, if the angel has a winning strategy against the nice devil, it has one against the evil devil. Now comes the second character, which we call the Runner. The Runner can't fly over burnt squares, so runs alongside them, always moving forward, and always keeping squares to her left. We'll colour in blue any square the Runner has been on. The author suggests imagining the squares not as holes, but as walls instead, so that we can imagine the Runner always keeping her left hand on a wall. In fact, we'll picture her painting that wall in green with her left hand. She can also get around corners tightly, and will allow her to squeeze through a corner joining two squares. Mate suggests imagining the burnt squares not as square-shaped, but as octagonal instead, allowing the runner to slip through easily. Finally, we'll ask the runner to simply go as far as she can within the accessible region the Angel of Power 2 would have. Obviously, the Angel of Power 2 can follow whatever moves the runner makes, so if the runner has a winning strategy, the Angel does as well. It's worth noting for later that if the runner loops, as she does here, the green paint forms the boundary of a collection of squares connected by their edges. Unfortunately, if the runner loops, she also loses. But bear in mind the boundary idea. Here's where the fun begins. We'll have our two new characters play against each other, the runner and the nice devil. I'll revert back to squares rather than octagons because it's a little nicer on the eyes when there are lots of them. The runner is going to do the following. Before the game starts, she offers the nice devil all the squares to her left. The nice devil happily takes the offer, since deleting, quote, half the board could only be an advantage. But even if it declines, the runner can just imagine they're there. She can start moving forward, painting them in green with her left hand. When she eventually reaches an obstacle set up by the devil, she follows the algorithm previously described. Now let's imagine an incredibly scary scenario where the devil has somehow built an enormous barrier like this. And let's imagine that the runner has run along it mindlessly as she would. I've made the number of burnt squares deliberately unrealistic to emphasize portions of the proof, but any barrier would do. Now let's pause to think. How would the nice devil win? Well, to trap the runner, it'll need to close a loop. But because this is the nice devil, it's blocked by the runner's original blue path, since it isn't allowed to burn any of those squares. So the only way the nice devil wins is to force the runner to rejoin her original path from below her starting level. And before that happens, the nice devil needs to force the runner to cross that horizontal threshold in the first place. Let's imagine the nice devil manages this, and let's pause just before the runner is about to cross that line. Mate proves this is impossible. To do so, we keep the game on pause, and we'll erase all of the pre burnt squares other than a column of width 1, stopping at the height of the northmost square burnt by the nice devil in the game. Let us say exactly t turns have occurred till this pause. With the nice devil frozen in time, we now imagine the runner continuing her journey, eventually reaching the starting point. I'd like to stress that this isn't part of the actual game against the nice devil, the purpose is just to get a contradiction on how many burnt squares are on the board. Let's say there are s squares. We have the amount going into that column, and let's call that number n, and then the ones which were burnt by the nice devil in-game. Let's say there are d of them. Now, remember the nice devil does not necessarily move each turn, so this number s is, at the very most, n plus the number of turns. Let's record that information and count again, but this time by counting the number of edges. Now, just how many edges were painted? Well, in the run between the start and reaching the threshold, the runner has painted at least two walls every turn except perhaps if she were interrupted on turn t and only managed to paint one edge on that turn. So a total of 2t minus 1. Next, we count one edge painted just before returning to the start, one edge painted at the top of the column, and at least one edge crossing the horizontal threshold. 
bringing us to 2t plus 2. In the run above the barrier, the runner will at least have painted n edges facing north, and at the very least, two edges facing west. A very crude bound, but it's enough. Finally, an additional n painted on the other side of the column. Let's record this lower bound on the painted edges and start thinking about all of the edges. Well, with s squares, there are 4s edges present on the board, and we can separate them into three types. The painted edges, which form the boundary of a connected family, the non-painted but exposed edges, for instance those trapped inside the connected family, or those outside of it, and finally, two times the number of connecting edges, since each edge connecting two squares counts for two edges. By simply ignoring the middle category, we get 4s as being at least as large as painted plus two times connecting. What's the smallest possible number of connecting edges? Well, that should simply be one less than the number of squares, which is what happens if every square touches exactly one other square. Less than that, and the family would no longer be connected. This updates our inequality likewise. And now we can invoke our bound on the painted edges. Plugging it in gives us this bound on 2s, which simplifies nicely. And that is a complete contradiction with our earlier bound on the number of squares in this dark, scary barrier, which said there could only be at most n plus t of them. So the runner can never reach that horizontal line, and so she can never be made to loop, and therefore will always escape the nice devil, traveling further and further north. I hope you enjoyed this video, which is based on the article The Angel of Power 2 Wins, written by Andras Mate, as well as elements from The Angel Problem, written by John Conway. If you'd like to see more of this type of content, please subscribe.